It was a glorious spring day, perfect for a day out in the forest. Ken Seely stood in a clearing, looking slowly about him, breathing in clear, fresh country air. It was a far cry from the pollution and stress of Sydney, two hours to the north, where he lived and worked. This was the time of the week that he looked forward to the most, when his orienteering club met for their weekly run. Normally, Ken bushwalked or ran the orienteering courses alone, but on Saturday the 19th of September 1992, the club had organized a training day along some of the many trails that crisscrossed the 40,000 acres of the beautiful Belangelo State Forest. Ken thought the forest had never looked so good. Everywhere around him was the lush, green vegetation of towering eucalyptus trees and native shrubs, bordered by commercial pine plantations. A stark contrast to the blackened desolation normally left after the many bushfires that had swept through the area in recent times. After a short navigational briefing, Ken and his running partner, Keith Caldwell, set off on the first leg of the run. The sport is not unlike rally driving, where the object is to run a predetermined course within a specified time, reaching and recording various checkpoints along the way. By early afternoon, they were deep in the forest close to one of the most spectacular landmarks of the area, Executioner's Drop, so called because of its sheer fall into a deep, wooded gorge. After recording their previous control points, staggered roughly half a mile apart, they took bearings on the next, control number four, designated by a large boulder. Approaching the boulder, Ken smelled something bad. As he got closer, the smell became more intense. He thought it was probably a rotting animal carcass. The forest provided a home to many wild animals. Kangaroos, wallabies, and even the elusive dingo roamed free, virtually unhindered by human intervention. Dismissing it from his mind, Ken concentrated on his navigational bearings and was about to move on when Keith called to him from the far side of the boulder. Can you smell that? he asked. The smell got stronger as they approached the western side of the boulder. Beneath a small overhang, they found a mound of debris, approximately seven feet long and two feet high. Stepping closer to the pile of branches and decaying leaves, the two men, braving the smell, saw what appeared to be a bone and a patch of hair. They weren't sure it was human until they saw part of a black t-shirt. They both walked slowly around the mound until they got to the northern end of it, where they stopped, staring down at the ground, trying to comprehend what they'd found. Protruding from the pile of brush was the heel of a shoe. By this time, it was 3.45 p.m. Soon, the forest floor would be in darkness as the sun dipped lower in the sky. They carefully marked the location on their map, 800 feet southwest of Long Acre Fire Trail, one of the many access trails in the area. A decision had to be made, backtrack the way they'd come in, or complete the course, which would take them out of the forest and bring them closer to their cars. They decided the latter choice would be quickest. Half an hour later, they rejoined their friends and quickly related the experience. They all agreed that the authorities should be informed as soon as possible. Contacting emergency services by mobile telephone, Seely, a gentle, soft-spoken man, was asked by the operator, Is this an emergency? When he replied, Not really, he was disconnected. Several phone calls later, he was finally connected with the duty officer at the local police station in Boral, a pretty little town nestled in the southern highlands of New South Wales. Seely identified himself and told the officer, I found a body in the Belangelo forest. He wasn't sure if they had taken him seriously. It wasn't long before he saw that they had. Uniformed police arrived just as the light was beginning to fade. They were shown the way to the sighting by torchlight marking the way with reflective tape. Local detectives arrived soon after and requested a crime scene unit from Goulburn, the next major town to the south. Lighting was organized for the scene, and not long after, regional detectives from the homicide squad arrived. A call was made to the Office of Detectives in Sydney's King's Cross, as well as the Missing Persons Bureau, as they were known to be investigating the disappearance of several backpackers who were last seen heading south. No one at the scene that day realized that the body that had been found would lead to the biggest murder investigation in Australia's history. Nor would they know the extent of pain and suffering that was shared by a small group of people from different parts of the world. Searching the area the following day, 
the two police constables, Roger Guff and Suzanne Roberts, found a second body. It was partially covered by a log just a hundred feet east of the first. A shoe and part of a lower leg were visible below a mound of leaves and branches that was roughly the same size as the first. Early media reports suggested that the bodies were the remains of two British backpackers, Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. They had been missing for five months after leaving King's Cross to travel south together looking for work. Police were yet to make a positive identification. In Australia and across the world, several families hearing of the grisly discovery contacted the authorities for more accurate information. In Germany, Manfred and Anke Nugebauer listened anxiously to the news, wondering if the bodies found were those of their son Gabor and his girlfriend Anya, who had disappeared without a trace after leaving a King's Cross backpackers hostel just after Christmas Day, 1991. Herbert Schmidl, in his home in Regensburg, near Munich, listened also, hoping that neither body was that of his only daughter, Simone, who had been missing since leaving Sydney in 1991. Several miles south of Belangelo, in Frankston, Victoria, Pat Everest wondered if it was her daughter Deborah and her friend James Gibson that were lying dead in the forest. They had been missing since 1989. Late in the afternoon of Sunday the 20th of September, police confirmed that the bodies were, in fact, those of Carolyn Clark and Joanne Walters. Joanne's parents, Ray and Jill Walters, had already been in Australia for a month prior to the discovery, searching in vain for some trace of their daughter. The police tracked them down in Sydney to give them the bad news. Police telephoned Ian and Jackie Clark in England and informed them that the second body was Carolyn's. The timing of the call was indeed fortunate. Shortly after the phone call, a local radio station carried the story of their daughter's death. As the investigation proceeded, it became apparent that the murders were committed with a high degree of violence and cruelty. Joanne Walters had been stabbed viciously in the heart and lungs with one wound so deep that it had cut deep into her spine. Carolyn Clark had also been stabbed and shot in the head multiple times. Homicide detectives Inspector Rob Godden and Sergeant Steve McClellan were appointed to take charge of the investigation. After his initial evaluation of the crime scene, McClellan speculated that because the bodies had been found in an isolated area, it was possible that the killer lived nearby. Crime scene detectives worked around the clock, analyzing and photographing every inch of the murder scene. Joanne Walters' body still had jewelry on both hands, and she was wearing blue jeans and black shoes. Curiously, the zip of the jeans was undone, but the top button was still fastened. Fourteen feet from where Carolyn Clark's body lay, six cigarette butts were found. They were all of the same brand. Someone had obviously spent quite a bit of time at the scene. Not far from them, a fired 22 caliber cartridge case was recovered, and next to it, a piece of green plastic the size of a large coin. Ballistic specialists scanned the area with metal detectors and found nine more cartridge cases 12 feet from Clark's body. From the ground directly below her head, three bullets were recovered. Detectives from the ballistics squad were confident that, given the conditions of the bullets and the spent cases, they'd be able to identify the gun that fired them. A further 120 feet from the murder scene, a fireplace had been built from house bricks. A strange thing to find deep in a forest. Over the next five days, 40 police searched a corridor 500 feet wide and one and a half miles long and did not find any more bodies, nor did they find the camping gear and personal items belonging to the two girls. Following the search, police told the media that they had virtually ruled out the possibility of finding other bodies in the forest. It was an announcement that would prove to be premature and cause a great deal of embarrassment to the New South Wales Police Department. Dr. Peter Bradhurst, the forensic pathologist assigned to the case, had the unpleasant task of performing the autopsies. The badly decomposed remains of the two girls had been carefully removed from the forest and transported to the morgue in Glebe, an inner suburb of Sydney. The first stage of the forensic investigation was to weigh and x-ray Joanne's body in search of bullets or other metallic objects. There were none. Carolyn's body was next, and the x-rays revealed that, even though her body was decomposed to a much greater extent than Joanne's, it clearly contained what the radiographer described as radio-opaque objects. To be more precise, four bullets. 
Next, Dr. Bradhurst began the external examination, methodically checking the entire body for physical evidence. Joanne's shirt and hands showed traces of dark hairs. The rotted remains of a cloth used as a gag were removed from her mouth, as were other cloth samples at the throat, suggesting strangulation. An internal examination showed no signs of vaginal or anal penetration, but given the poor condition of the body tissue, it was very difficult to tell. Hair and nail samples were taken for matching with other samples found. A vaginal swab was also taken, as sperm samples can remain in a body for weeks or even months. Joanne's chest showed three stab wounds to the right side, one to the left side, and a further stab wound to the neck. When the body was rolled over, the full extent of what could only be described as a frenzied attack became clear. A further two wounds were found to the left side, five more to the right, and two to the spine at the base of the neck. Fourteen wounds in all were recorded and measured. The internal exam revealed that five of the stab wounds had cut the spine. Dr. Bradhurst speculated that any of the spinal wounds could have been delivered prior to the fatal blows, thereby rendering the victim totally helpless. Two ribs had been totally severed. The hands and arms showed no defensive wounds that normally occur when the victim attempts to ward off a knife attack. This, coupled with the remains of the gag and neck ligature, indicated that the killer was completely in control during the murder. The wounds measured one and a half inches by a quarter inch with the profile of a bowie knife or similar style blade. The arms of Carolyn Clark's body were stretched above her head, which had a red cloth wrapped around it. Bullet holes were clearly visible in the decaying cloth. The cloth was carefully removed and the extent of the injuries became evident. A total of ten bullet holes riddled the skull. Only four exit wounds were found. Four complete 22 caliber projectiles were recovered from inside the skull. The front of the face and the jaw were shattered, possibly damaged by exiting bullets. She had one single stab wound to the upper back, identical to the wounds of the first victim. The bullets from the body were cleaned and passed on to Sergeant Gerard Dutton, the ballistics expert who was present at the postmortems. He was confident that they, like the other bullets and fired cases collected from the scene, would lead to the identity of the weapon used. A reenactment at the scene later revealed that the gunshot wounds were consistent with having been fired from three different locations. However, all ten fired cases were found close together. Sergeant Dutton suggested that the killer may have stood in the one spot and fired the shots, stopping to move the victim's head between volleys. In short, he had used her for target practice. In an unusual step, Professor John Hilton, the head of forensic medicine, released details of the findings to the large group of reporters who had gathered outside the morgue. Not accustomed to giving media conferences, he spoke in a faltering, hesitant voice. Even though he was an experienced pathologist and forensic scientist, he was obviously disturbed by the extent of the injuries and the sheer brutality of the attack. Weeks after the discovery of the two bodies, detectives Godden and McClellan had amassed an array of physical evidence, but were no closer to gathering any real clues as to the identity of the person responsible. There had been several alleged sightings of the girls prior to the discovery, and even a few after the time the girls had died. The trail was already cold when police became involved. Now it was becoming colder. In an attempt to try to shed new light on the investigation, Dr. Rod Milton, a forensic psychiatrist with over 20 years crime scene experience, was asked to consult on the case. Dr. Milton had previously aided police in the hunt and subsequent arrest of John Wayne Glover, the North Side serial killer who'd bashed and strangled six elderly women in 1989. The profile that Dr. Milton had provided to police was incredibly accurate, except for the age. Milton had suggested that the killer would be a teenager, based on historical data which indicated the most serious offenses against aged victims were committed by persons under 20. His analysis, although slightly inaccurate, led to Glover's capture. Glover was 59 years of age at the time of his arrest. The detectives drove Dr. Milton to Belangelo at his request. As he explained to them, even though he had access to the detailed police reports and photographs, he needed to view the crime scenes for himself so that he could get a feel for the way that the killer had approached his victims. He 
He stepped from the car and walked to the two grave sites in turn. After wandering slowly around the area for some time, he sat quietly in the middle of the scene and thought about why the killer had chosen that particular site. Why did he leave the victims the way he did? What was his motivation? His first thought was that the killer was familiar with the area. From experience, he knew that killers very rarely operate in unfamiliar surroundings. This wasn't a crime of opportunity, but rather a planned murder. Walking between the two graves, he quizzed the police on the details of the investigation. What was found and where? He pondered the variations between the two deaths. Caroline Clark was killed in a cold and calculated fashion. The way that the article of clothing had been wrapped around her head indicated that the killer had done so to depersonalize her. The angle of the shots suggested that the first bullet may have been fired while she was kneeling. Her clothing was intact, except for her front-fastening bra, which was unclipped. The clothing on her lower body was in place at the time of death. This indicated to Milton that her killing was not sexually motivated, but more in the style of an execution. The single stab wound to her body, he believed, was inflicted after death as a final example of the killer's control over his victim, or perhaps the work of an accomplice. In fact, prior to Dr. Milton's involvement, police thought the murders to be the work of more than one killer. The manner in which Miss Clark's body was laid out with the arms above the head also suggested control and planning on the part of the killer, with the victim acting out the role of supplicant after death. In comparison, Joanne Walter's body and burial site indicated rage and uncontrolled frenzy. The disarray of the clothing, Milton thought, indicated more of a sexual attack. The shirt and bra had been pushed up, but the clasp was still fastened. The zipper of the jeans was undone, but the top button was done up. No panties were found on the body or in the area. Milton theorized that because the shoes were still on and laced up, the jeans had not been taken completely off. It was more likely that they were dragged down to enable the killer, or killers, to commit a sexual act, before or after death. The underwear may have been cut off and taken as a trophy. When asked by the police for a possible motive, the basis of most homicide investigations, Milton uttered a single word, pleasure. He believed that if there were two killers involved, one would be older and dominant, the other, although equally sadistic, would tend to be more submissive. He suggested that they could be brothers, sharing a common interest in guns and hunting, and had probably been involved in other sexually related crimes, either together or separately. Later, at his Sydney office, Dr. Milton recorded his profile in point form. The main offender, he believed, would live on the outskirts of a city in a semi-rural area, be employed in a semi-skilled job probably out of doors, be involved in an unstable or unsatisfactory relationship, have a history of homosexuality or bisexual activity, have a history of aggression against authority, be aged in his mid-thirties. At no time did Dr. Milton give any indication that the deaths were the work of a serial killer. As the end of the year drew closer, the investigation team dwindled in size as the resources were redirected to other crimes. They knew that they would need some startling piece of evidence or a stroke of luck if they were to solve the riddle of the Belangolo killings. Bruce Pryor had been into the Belangolo forest many times over the years collecting firewood. It had become a special place for him. He knew many of the trails, yet there were still many parts of it that he'd not seen. As a local, he'd been watching the reports of the killings with more than a passing interest, and as a parent, he felt deeply for the families of the girls. He couldn't clear it from his mind, and during many trips to the forest, he found himself searching areas that he hadn't been to before without knowing why. The official search had been called off many months before, and the investigation was almost non-existent. The last mention of the case had been a public meeting in the Boral Town Hall that had been organized by police as a means of jogging the memories of local residents as they still believed that the killer lived close to the forest. The meeting mentioned other young backpackers who were still unaccounted for. For days after, the thought of more young bodies in the forest tormented him, interrupting his work and his sleep. He set out one morning with no real intention of going to Belangolo, 
but found himself drawn to the area. He turned down a track that he'd been to before, but instead of driving to the end of it as he usually did, he turned into a small side track called the Maurice Fire Trail. He drove down it and came to a T-intersection. He knew the right arm led to a track called Searley's Exit Fire Trail, but he'd never been down the left-hand track. The track soon opened up onto a bare, rocky area. To one side of it was a small fireplace built from bush rocks. He got out of his vehicle and wandered slowly around the area, still not sure of why he was there. In a clearing about 150 feet from his car, he stopped and stared at the ground, his heart pounding in his chest. There, at his feet, was a large bone. It looked human. He shook his head, trying to think clearly. Maybe it was from a kangaroo. Tentatively, he lifted the bone and measured it against his own thigh. It was the same length. One end of the bone had teeth marks on it. Maybe it was an animal bone. He lay the bone back down where he'd found it and walked further ahead. He walked up an incline, scanning the ground, hoping to find the rest of a kangaroo skeleton. At the top of the ridge, he turned and walked back to his car, but changed direction slightly, walking through an area overgrown with weeds. A flash of white caught his eye. Parting the tangled undergrowth, he saw a sight that raised the hair on the back of his neck. The lifeless eye sockets of a human skull stared up at him. It was small, possibly an older child or a female. Part of the lower jaw was broken away, and as he looked closer, he saw a thin cut in the forehead. It looked like a knife wound. He was unsure of what to do next. Afraid that no one would believe him, he took the skull back to his car and wrapped it in a cloth and drove out of the forest. As he neared the entrance, he saw a vehicle near a small hut that was used by the orienteering club. Bruce approached the hut and spoke to John Springett, a local builder who was doing maintenance on the hut. Do you have a phone here? He asked. I have a mobile in the truck. Why? What's up? Bruce told him of his discovery. We better call the police. John got a phone book from the clubhouse and Bruce rang Bowrill Detectives. He got no answer. He tried the police station instead. I found parts of a skeleton in Belangelo Forest, he told them. Half an hour later, two uniformed officers arrived at the hut. What have you got for me? One of them asked. It's in the car, Pryor answered. He led them to his vehicle and unwrapped his find. The young constable, obviously the one who had taken the call, seemed surprised that it really was a skull. He placed a radio call to the duty detectives, Peter Lovell and Stephen Murphy, who arrived shortly after. They asked Pryor to show them where he'd found the skull. After studying the area for a short time, Detective Murphy walked further on. 120 feet into the forest, he stopped and looked down. He walked back to where his partner stood talking to Bruce Pryor about the skeleton. There's a pair of sand shoes sticking out of a pile of brush back there, he declared casually. They both looked warily at Pryor, curious as to why he came to this particular location. Several radio calls later, the search was back on. News of the discovery of additional bodies in the forest spread quickly. TV network helicopters hovered overhead. Reporters and film crews were lined up at the access road trying to gain entry. They speculated as to the identities of the latest victims. Was it the German couple or maybe the couple from Victoria? They asked detectives at the scene. The investigators said nothing. Their minds were occupied with their own questions. Had they called off the search too early? Were they searching the wrong areas? How many more bodies were there? One of the searchers found a floppy black felt hat near one of the grave sites. The Sydney Missing Persons Office was contacted and a review of files indicated that it may have belonged to James Gibson, a young Victorian who was last seen hitchhiking south of the forest in the company with a female friend, Deborah Everest, also from Victoria. They had been missing since 1989. Police had earlier discounted Gibson as a possible victim after his backpack and camera had been found lying beside the road 78 miles north of Belangelo in another small forest area called Gulston Gorge. Police were puzzled. If one of the victims was Gibson, how did his property get to the other side of Sydney? Further investigation of the report indicated that when the pack and camera had been found, 
they'd been leaning against a guardrail, in plain view, on the side of a busy road. Were they placed there by the killer in an attempt to divert attention from the southern forest? Crime scene police worked into the night to complete their preliminary investigation and left the scene under heavy police guard. The following day, scientific officers Gross and Goldie returned to the grave sites in company with Dr. Pradhurst and a forensic odontologist, Dr. Chris Griffiths. Both of the bodies were skeletons. However, both were incomplete. Several bones had been scattered across the site, possibly by animal activity. Beside the first body, Gross found a silver fob chain, a bracelet set with semi-precious stones, and a silver crucifix. Given the find and the smaller size of the skeleton, it was presumed to be female. The second skeleton was larger and still had a pair of white sneakers laced to the feet. Dr. Griffiths examined the skull and, after cleaning dirt from it, compared the teeth with a dental chart that had been supplied to police earlier. It was a positive match. The body was that of James Gibson. Positive identification of the second body would come later, but police were almost certain that it was Deborah Everest. The remains were carefully removed and taken to the Sydney morgue for reconstruction and post-mortem examination. As well as the skeletons, several bags of decayed matter from the immediate area were also taken. It was not known for sure if they contained vegetable matter or decayed clothing or both. One of the items from James Gibson's remains was easy to identify. It was the complete zipper from a pair of jeans. The zip was open, the top button still fastened. The following day, Dr. Bradhurst began the task of reconstructing the skeletons in anatomical order. The bones had been boiled in a special solution to clean the skeleton and make any injuries easier to identify. Dr. Bradhurst began with what was left of James Gibson. The decayed matter that accompanied his remains was sifted and found to contain several hand and foot bones, some jewelry, and buttons. As the remains began to take shape, the extent of the wounds became clearer. One stab wound had penetrated the mid-thoracic spine, slicing upwards through three vertebrae, splitting the canal holding the spinal column. As with the previous bodies, the wound would have paralyzed the victim first. To do so much damage to a young, healthy body would have taken great physical strength. Two stab wounds had punctured the breastbone, with cuts to the ribs indicating two more wounds to the left and right sides of the front of the chest and two more in the upper back. Seven major wounds marked the skeleton. Many more could have penetrated the body without touching bone. The stab wounds and the breastbone were measured. They were very close to the size of the wounds inflicted to Walters and Clark. The second smaller skeleton was in poorer condition. Part of the jaw was broken away. Several fractures were found at the base of the skull. Four slash marks to the forehead, two on each side, were not deep enough to have been fatal but it etched into the skull at the hairline. A further stab wound had penetrated the lower back close to the spine. While Bradhurst was completing his examination, crime scene analysts were combing the grave sites for further clues. Thirty feet from the body, they found a black bra with a stab wound through one of the cuffs. Later, a pair of grey tights was found under leaf litter close to the female grave site. They had been tied with a loop at either end, possibly used as a primitive restraint. Later that day, the female remains were confirmed by dental charts as being those of Deborah Everest. Superintendent Clive Small was deputized by Commissioner of Police Tony Lauer to take over control of the investigation. His first task was to combine the individual groups of detectives involved in the investigation into one cohesive unit. Small was an experienced detective with a reputation for being thorough and, more importantly, objective. He was well-respected in the department and the courts for his dedication, his ability to separate the facts from the bulk of erroneous information, and to present those facts in a meticulously detailed fashion. The investigation was officially named Task Force Air. The name was intended to be Air, named after a salt lake in the centre of Australia, in keeping with the department's tradition of using geographical place names. The name had been subsequently misspelled in a press release as Air, and quickly became the official title. Small appointed as his second in charge the equally talented and meticulous Detective Inspector Rod Lynch. 
Lynch's job was to set up and coordinate the Sydney headquarters of the investigation, while Small, based near the forest in Boral, would oversee the on-site investigation. Lynch was faced with a challenge almost from the beginning. The building that was allocated as his headquarters was a converted factory that had once been the home of Sydney's criminal investigation branch. Having laid idle since the CIB had relocated to larger premises, it was in a bad state of repair. It had no phones, air conditioning, computers, furniture, and the plumbing was substandard. After solving these and other logistical problems, he began recruiting detectives for the task of following up on the many thousands of pieces of information that had already been received. The next task was to set up a public hotline in cooperation with the media, which would appeal to the general public for any information regarding the events in the forest. From his broad experience in major investigations, Lynch knew that this would increase his team's workload dramatically, but would be the most valuable resource of real evidence as opposed to the circumstantial evidence that had already been collected. Small called off the examination of the forest for several days to enable him to view maps and surveys of the area and plan a more expansive search of the general area. Chief Inspector Bob May from the Tactical Support Unit was put in charge of the search team. He divided a map in the main forest area into grids, every inch representing 750 square feet. Forty officers walked each grid side by side, examining every inch of the forest floor. If anything of interest was found, they would shout, find, and scientific police would come forward, take photographs, mark the position on the map, and bag any evidence found. The search was further enhanced by teams of dogs that had been specially trained to detect the presence of phosphorus and nitrogen in the soil. A decaying body will emit traces of these chemicals long after death. The dogs had been used extensively in the United States to sniff out old Civil War graves. Meanwhile, another search was underway. The bullets and shell casings taken from the scene, having been positively identified as being from a Ruger repeating rifle, were the only positive leads that could link the killer to the scene. From their inquiries, police learned that over 50,000 such rifles had been imported into Australia between 1964 and 1982. The manufacturers provided a list of their distributors in Australia, who in turn provided a list of the gun shops who had purchased them. While gun shops were required by law to keep a record of each firearm sold, there was no such legal requirement for any subsequent private sales of the firearms. Police were faced with a needle-in-a-haystack scenario. A list of all such weapons owned by residents in the areas surrounding the forest was drawn up with the intention of impounding the rifles for test firings in an attempt to find a match. The plan was leaked to the press, which infuriated investigators, as they believed that the killer, upon hearing the news, would dump the murder weapon. Members of the local gun club were contacted and their weapons examined. One of the members told the detectives that a friend of his had witnessed something suspicious in the forest the previous year. Police later contacted the man who gave them an incredibly accurate description of two vehicles, one a Ford sedan and the other a four-wheel drive that he saw driving down one of the trails into the forest. He told them that as the first vehicle passed him, he looked in and saw a man driving and in the back seat were two other men. Between them was a female with a cloth tied around her head like a gag. In the second vehicle were two men, one driving and the other sitting in the back next to another female who was also bound. He gave police detailed descriptions of all the occupants, including clothing, coloring, and approximate ages. He stated that at the time, he'd written down the details of the number plate of the second vehicle on a scrap of cardboard, but had since lost it. Police typed out an official statement and asked him to read it and, if he agreed with the details, sign it. He signed his name, Alex Millat. Twenty-six days had passed since Deborah Everest's body had been found in the forest. The searchers were tired. They'd covered most of the allotted search area and were now entering the final gridded section three miles east of the last grave. Confidence was running high to the point that the police public relations section were already compiling a press release expressing the opinion that no further bodies would be found in the Belangelo forest. The search team leader, Sergeant Jeff Trichter, led the searchers into a small clearing. A pair of pink women's jeans and a length of blue and yellow rope lay in plain view. 
Next to them was an empty 22 bullet packet. The find was not unusual, as a lot of strange items had been found that were seemingly unrelated. Moving deeper into the clearing, they found more articles. Empty drink cans riddled with bullet holes, a length of wire bent into loops, cartridge cases, and empty bottles. At the edge of the clearing, Sergeant Trichter saw something that fired warning signals into his brain. A primitive fireplace. Knowing that the final part of the search was going to be intensive, Trichter decided to give his men a lunch break and spend the rest of the day in the area. No sooner had they resumed when one of the men called, Find. The line stopped and Trichter walked to the edge of the rocky outcrop where Senior Constable Rullis stood with his arm raised. It was a bone, and it looked human. Ten feet further on, at the base of a pile of timber, lay a skull. The site was marked, and the crime scene squad was summoned by radio. Beyond the timber lay the now-familiar pile of sticks and brush. Protruding from one end of it was a large bone inside a brown leather hiking boot. Searchers spread out and scoured the area around the grave, but no further remains were found. John Goldie, the senior crime scene investigator, identified the remains as female. She appeared to be alone. A distinctive purple headbound was found on the skull. That and the clothing found near the body, after comparisons with missing persons reports, indicated that the skeleton was all that remained of missing German girl Simone Schmidl. The other items mentioned in the report, a large backpack and other camping equipment, were not found. Dr. Chris Griffiths, the forensic odontologist, was summoned to the scene and shortly after he arrived with his file of dental charts, the body was officially identified as Simone. The young adventurous girl, who her family and friends had called Simi, had been last seen on January 20th, 1991 in Liverpool, west of Sydney, hitchhiking south. The confident and seasoned traveler, who had seen much of the world, ended her days in a lonely forest thousands of miles away from the safety and security of her home. In Germany, Simone's parents heard the news in the worst possible way, on the radio. They contacted German police for confirmation, and even though Australian authorities had advised them of the discovery, the German police department did not confirm the identification until more than two weeks after Simone's remains had been flown home and buried. The original press release was aborted, and another sent out in its place. It basically said that the police now believe that there were more bodies in the forest. Speculation was rife that the next bodies found would be those of the two Germans who were still unaccounted for. Simone's body was found still partially dressed, with her shirt and underclothing pushed up around the neck. A pair of green shorts hung on the pelvis with the cord ties undone. Several items of jewelry and two coins were found next to the body. The pink jeans were not Simone's, but matched the description of a pair worn by another German girl, Anja Habstied. She and her boyfriend Gabor Nigebauer had been missing since December 1991. Two days later, as the search continued, the remains were transported to Sydney for the post-mortem. Dr. Bradhurst examined the almost complete skeleton. He had no doubt that it was the work of the same killer. There was no injury to the skull. The chest and back showed numerous stab wounds to the left and right sides, front and back, including the telltale knife thrusts to the spinal area, which had severed the spinal column completely. No sooner was he completing his grisly task than he was summoned back to the forest. The message was simple. We found two more. Dr. Bradhurst and Dr. Griffiths were conveyed to the scene by police helicopter and taken to the site of the new graves, which lay 150 feet apart at the very edge of the prescribed search area, denoted on the map as Area A. Dr. Griffiths had in his possession the dental charts for the boy, Gabor. The charts for his companion, Anya, had not arrived from Germany. Gabor's remains were under a pile of brush partially covered by a large log. It took several burly police officers to lift it away from the grave. Dr. Griffiths confirmed Gabor's identity. His skeleton was complete with the remains of decayed clothing evident, including a pair of jeans with the zip opened and the top button fastened. The second body, although not officially confirmed as Anya's, 
was that of a young female. The upper clothing was bunched up around the shoulders, and no lower clothing was found on or near the body. The pink jeans had been found some distance away. The female skeleton had one striking feature. The head and the first two vertebrae were missing. No other wounds were evident. On closer examination, Dr. Bradhurst deduced that the head had been severed from the body cleanly by a sharp instrument, possibly a machete or sword. The angle of the cut indicated that the victim had probably been in a kneeling position with her head down when the cut was made. It showed all the signs of some form of ritual decapitation. The task force commander, Clive Small, gave a short media interview near the grave sites. He told reporters that following the discovery of the new bodies, that they were now looking for a serial killer. It came as no surprise. The media had been reporting that opinion since the investigation began. Back at the morgue, Dr. Bradhurst examined Gabor's remains. The mouth contained two gags, one that had been tied across the mouth using a reef knot. The other had been placed in the mouth prior to the other being tied. Even though Bradhurst had performed all of the autopsies, he still retained the details of them all in his mind. One thing that didn't escape his attention was the fact that this gag was tied with a different knot. The last gag used, the one on Joanne Walter's body, had been tied in a simple overhand or granny knot. The size of the cloth in the mouth cavity made strangulation very likely. Supportive to this theory was the fractured hyoid bone in the throat, which is usually an indication of manual strangulation. The jaw was fractured in several places. The skull showed six bullet entry wounds, three from the left rear and the others from the lower rear. One exit wound was found on the right side. Gerald Dutton, the ballistics investigator on the case, was present when the examination of the skull took place. Four bullets were recovered from inside the skull. A fifth bullet was recovered from the bones of the upper body. Dutton had found no fired cases near the body, and the angle and alignment of the entry wounds versus the exit wounds indicated that seven bullets had been fired into the skull. When found, the skull had been lying on its side, but after searching the soil under the grave, no spent bullets were recovered. Gabor had not been killed at the gravesite. Later, several fired bullets and empty cartridge packets would be found near the new graves. Over 90 fired cases were found scattered around the area. After examination under a comparison microscope, the cases and bullets were positively identified as the same as those found at the Walters site. The ballistic evidence showed conclusively that the same weapon that murdered Joanne Walters had been used only 200 feet from Anya and Gabor's remains. Dr. Bradhurst completed the examination of Anya's skeleton and found no other evidence of additional wounds. Most horrifying was the fact that the seven had died in various ways. They had been either beaten, strangled, shot, stabbed, and decapitated, and almost certainly sexually molested in some way, male and female alike. Given the extent of the injuries and the various methods used to inflict them, the investigation team deduced that the killer, or killers, spent more time with each victim as the crimes progressed. This fact indicated that, apart from being cruel and sadistic, the perpetrator was a calculating and confident individual. Paul Onions had arrived in Australia, eager to see the country about which he'd heard so much. He stayed at a modest backpacker hotel in Sydney's King's Cross, spending his time seeing the sights and generally having a good time partying with friends. As his money dwindled, his thoughts turned to part-time work. His visa was good for six months, but his money looked like it was running out before that time expired. He asked around the city, but found casual work hard to come by. One of his friends suggested fruit picking. After making further inquiries, he learned that most of the work on offer was in the Riverina district, several hundred miles to the south. He decided to save the cost of the fare by taking the train to Liverpool, southwest of Sydney, and hitchhiking from there. On the 25th of January, 1990, he set out early for the station and was soon standing on the side of the Hume Highway in Liverpool, waiting for a ride. The heat was searing as he stood trying to flag down a suitable southbound vehicle. 
His only possessions were a small pack containing a Sony Walkman, a camera, and several items of clothing. He walked south, trying desperately to thumb a ride. Stopping at a small shopping center, he bought a drink and was seriously contemplating returning to the hostel when a fit, well-muscled man approached him and asked, in a distinctive Australian accent, You need a lift? Paul told him his destination and accepted his offer of a ride gladly. The two men climbed into the stranger's four-wheel drive vehicle and headed south. The first thing Paul noticed about the man, apart from his muscular build, was his long Zapata-styled mustache. They talked for a while and Paul introduced himself, and the man told him his name was Bill. Paul's newfound friend was full of questions. Where are you from? When are you due back? Who knows you're here? What's your occupation? So many questions, but Bill seemed friendly enough, so Paul answered them. Bill told Paul that he worked on the roads, was from a Yugoslavian family, lived near Liverpool, and was divorced. They drove for an hour, and Bill's demeanor began to change. His language became more aggressive and critical. He became agitated and launched into a racist tirade about gooks and pommies, and shortly after became morose and refused to talk. By mid-afternoon, after leaving the southern town of Mittagong, Paul noticed that Bill was acting strangely, varying his speed and looking in the rearview mirror every few seconds. Paul, feeling tired and drained from the trip, began to feel uneasy. Bill leaned forward, adjusting the radio, and said, I think I'll pull over and get some tapes from the back. As they pulled up on the side of the freeway, Paul looked down and noticed a tray full of tape cassettes in the front console between the seats. As Bill got out, Paul decided to get out as well. Get back in the car, Bill told him, his voice full of menace. Not wanting to alarm him any further, Paul complied. As soon as they got back in the car, Bill reached under the driver's seat, pulled out a large black revolver, and pointed it at Paul. This is a robbery, he said. Again, he reached under the seat and produced a coil of rope. Paul, highly alarmed, tried to reason with Bill. What's going on? What are you doing? he asked. He was told in a firm but controlled manner, Shut up and put your seatbelt back on. Paul, scared out of his wits, started to obey, but instead grabbed for the door handle and leapt to the ground. Paul ran away from the car, hearing the words, Stop or I'll shoot, from behind him. Panicking, he ran into the oncoming traffic, causing cars to swerve alarmingly, trying to avoid this madman on the road. Briefly, he looked back, expecting to see Bill chasing him. Instead, he saw him standing casually by his vehicle, grinning. Get back here, you, he called. Paul managed to flag down a van. As it slowed, he ran to the grass dividing strip in the middle of the highway. Bill lunged at him from behind, tackling him to the ground. Paul managed to break free and ran to the van and threw himself in front of it. The driver, Joanne Barry, a local resident, slammed on the brakes and before she could protest, Paul leapt inside the van, screaming, He's got a gun! Help me! Joanne, against her better judgment, drove away. In the car were her sister and four children. She feared for their safety and was about to ask him to get out. She looked into his face and, seeing his look of terror, decided to take him to the nearest police station, which was in the opposite direction. As she turned the van around, she noticed the other man running back to his car. He looked like he was carrying something. Anxious to put some distance between them, she accelerated rapidly. When they reached Mittagong Police Station, it was closed. They drove on to the next town, Boral. Paul related his story to Constable Janet Nicholson at the front desk, describing his attacker, the vehicle, and the pack he'd left behind. He detailed its contents, including his passport and return ticket to England. After filling out a detailed report, Constable Nicholson circulated the man's description and the details of his vehicle via radio and advised Paul to return to the hostel. He explained his financial predicament and was given $20. She explained to him that without a registration number, they had very little chance of locating the suspect vehicle. He went to the British High Commission when he returned to Sydney to replace his passport and to borrow additional funds. He got the passport, but no cash. A woman waiting behind him felt sorry for him and gave him 
he was amazed at her generosity. Weeks later, after deciding to stay in Australia, he found a well-paying job. His girlfriend arrived from England shortly after, and they traveled around the north of Australia for a few weeks, then left for home. After arriving home, Paul attempted to settle back into a normal life, but over the next year had trouble sleeping and developed a string of mysterious illnesses. Several years later, Paul learned of the discovery of the bodies near where he was attacked. The thought chilled him to the bone as he relived the incident in his mind. Back in Australia, the investigation was still dragging on. Over 200 police still searched the forest. At the task force headquarters, thousands of calls regarding the events in Belangelo poured in every week. Two such calls in particular were interesting. One was from a woman who claimed her boyfriend worked with a man who she thought should be checked out. He owned a property near the forest, drove a four-wheel drive, and owned a lot of guns. His name was Ivan Milat. The second call was from Joanne Berry, who described the time that she had picked up Paul Onions after his attack. These, like the other calls, had to be recorded and entered into an extensive computer database, which was becoming increasingly overloaded. In short, they were buried under the weight of the many crank calls and alleged sightings. Paul Onions called the Australian High Commission and was given the hotline number of the task force. On the 13th of November, 1993, he told the officer who answered the telephones the details of his attack in 1990 and was asked why he hadn't reported it then. When he replied that he had, he expected the officer to ask him where and when and the name of the officer he spoke to. Instead, he was thanked for the information and the call was terminated. When he didn't hear any word weeks later, he decided that his report was of no value and did his best to clear his mind of it. The official search of the forest was suspended on the 17th of November, 1993. No more bodies or additional evidence had been found. By December 1993, it was apparent that although an enormous amount of information had been compiled, the investigation wasn't progressing at an acceptable rate. 10,000 running sheets had been assembled, mostly by hand. Of the thousands of calls received over the hotline, police had produced a list of 2,000 persons of interest that callers had suggested may have committed the crimes or had some knowledge of them. The sheer volume of data overloaded the computer system. The program called TIMS, Task Force Information Management System, was made up of multiple databases that stored the information in various subject areas. However, it was unable to cross-reference more than a single inquiry because the system had not been designed to handle the volume and complexities involved in an investigation of such magnitude. The decision was taken to introduce a new program, which would be more powerful and flexible enough to handle the task. This meant long weeks of data entry and compilation, which meant all data received in the meantime would have to be processed by hand. Detective Senior Constable Gagan, the senior analyst for the task force, assembled his team and began the long, grueling process. Every file had to be read, assessed, and set aside to be entered into an appropriate section of the database at a later time. One such file came to the attention of the analysis team because of the unusual surname of the person involved. The name was Onions, Paul Onions. They read the report and added it to the lead file for further attention. Several weeks later, a similar report came to light. It was Joanne Berry's statement regarding the Onions incident it too was filed for further attention. Early in the new year, 37 detectives were working full-time on the investigation. The main focus was tracking down the suspect firearm and ammunition used in the offenses. Two of the new detectives assigned to the case, Senior Constables Gordon and McCluskey, were given the job of following up on a file that contained three separate leads. Gordon looked at the name on the file folder. Milat. Lynn Butler and Paul Douglas were interviewed and confirmed their earlier statements. The third lead was from the woman whose boyfriend had worked with Ivan Milat, but as she hadn't given her name, Douglas decided to go to the company in question, ReadyMix, and ask about Milat. Richard and Ivan Milat had both worked there at one time. They learned that Ivan had been a hard worker and was highly respected. 
Richard, on the other hand, was remembered as being crazy and unpredictable. Timesheets were requested for both men, but when matched up later with the approximate times and dates of the offenses, Richard was found to have been working on every occasion. However, his brother Ivan had been away from work when each of the murders had taken place. Gordon felt that Milat was fast becoming the prime suspect, but when he raised the subject with his superiors, he was told, get more evidence. Gordon searched criminal records and found that Ivan Milat had been found guilty of committing various offenses and had served several years in prison. None of the offenses indicated that he was a potential serial killer. After digging further through the archives, he found something that really aroused his suspicion. In 1971, Ivan had picked up two girls hitchhiking from Liverpool to Melbourne and had allegedly raped one of them. Both girls testified that he was armed with a large knife and carried a length of rope. He was later acquitted when the prosecution case was dismissed as unproven. Gordon and McCluskey again went to their superiors to request phone taps on Milat's house and to have listening devices installed in his car. Clive Small refused. Gordon was not impressed. Small had made the correct decision. The law was very firm on the subject of electronic surveillance. It was only to be used when all other methods of acquiring evidence had been exhausted. He also knew, from long experience, that although one suspect stood out, to build a strong case, they would have to investigate and eliminate any other suspects. Several days later, he assigned four detectives, including Gordon and McCluskey, to work full-time following up the Milat leads and also arranging for surveillance team, known as the Dog Squad, to follow Milat and watch his house. The Milat team began the extensive task of interviewing, checking, and cross-checking statements and amassing evidence. It was a task that would occupy them for several months. For Detective Gordon, it was a frustrating time, but he was still quietly confident that they were close to their man. To strengthen his investigation team, Superintendent Small began to assemble a team of experts to examine the motives and state of mind of the type of person that would have committed these hideous crimes. Knowing that the end result of the long and protracted saga that the case had become would be a trial of epic proportions, Small wanted the opinions of several experienced professionals to further enhance and support the weight of evidence. The police psychiatrist, Dr. Rod Milton, was essential to the proceedings. Since the beginning of the case, he'd studied and reviewed every shred of information as it came to hand. He watched carefully as his original profile began to take realistic shape. Small's second choice was Dr. Richard Basham, the Dean of Anthropology at Sydney University. Basham, an American, had assisted police previously with investigations of Asian crime in Australia. His forte was psychological anthropology, but he was well-versed in experimental and clinical psychology. Milton and Basham were wary of each other at first, but came to respect each other's abilities very quickly. Another member was Bob Young, a trained sociologist and computer analyst. His expertise was in research methods and was very experienced in the handling of large amounts of data. Small still believed that the killer lived somewhere in the Southern Highlands, the region that incorporated Belangelo. His plan was to organize a door-to-door -door survey of the entire area in search of the murder weapon. The panel disagreed. They reasoned that police resources were stretched to the limit as it was. Most of them felt, particularly Basham, that the person and or weapons that they sought was mentioned somewhere in the mountain of information that had already been received. As the group reviewed some of the files, one particular statement, Alex Milat's, was mentioned. Small told them of the depth of detail it contained and suggested that the person who gave it must possess a photographic memory. Basham suggested that to retain such detail could also mean that he might have been part of the events that he had recalled so well. It was an interesting theory. Basham was also of the opinion that more than one person was involved, probably a brother. When part of the ballistic evidence was presented, the panel discussed the scratches that were found on some of the spent projectiles, possibly caused by a crude silencer. Well, a silencer could mean that this man is living in a fantasy world, Basham said. He probably owns a motorcycle too. 
he considers himself an outlaw. Milton agreed. He went back to the brothers' theory. We could be looking for a group of brothers who spend their time in the forests shooting cans and wounding animals and generally showing off with each other. Small's ears pricked up. We have a family just like that on file, he said. Well, watch them closely, Basham replied. One or more of them could be who you're looking for. The discussion turned to the probable location of the killer. Milton suggested that the killer might not live in the immediate vicinity, but may visit the area regularly and could even own or rent a property nearby. After studying maps, they deduced that the killer would most probably live in an area to the north, close to the Hume Highway. The fact that all the victims had, at some stage, been seen at or near Liverpool and their bodies found in Belangelo Forest strengthened that theory. The members of the panel were unaware of the interest the police were taking in the Millat family. In fact, their name hadn't been mentioned during the briefing. Small knew that they still had a long way to go to build a case, but couldn't help thinking how closely the Millat family matched the theories. The painstaking search for supportive evidence continued through to March 1994. The Milat team obtained records of all premises and vehicles that the Milats had owned in the past. They found that three of the Milat brothers owned a small property on the Wambayan Caves Road, 25 miles from Belangelo. In addition, one vehicle found was a silver Nissan Patrol four-wheel drive that had been owned by Ivan Milat. The new owner was interviewed and showed police a bullet that he'd found under the driver's seat. It was a 22 caliber and was later analyzed and found to be consistent with the empty boxes found in Area A and cartridge cases found at the Clark and Walters gravesites. Melat had sold the vehicle two months after the bodies of the two English girls had been discovered. Detective Gordon and his team were uncovering numerous pieces of evidence, but still needed something to tie it all together. Additional evidence that would put Ivan Milat and his vehicle in the area at the time of the offenses. They tried using the new computer database in the hope of finding the match that they were looking for, but after entering keywords such as silver four-wheel drive, Liverpool, and hitchhiker, no matches were found. The system was better than the previous one, but was still not capable of providing the information that was required. They began the unenviable task of sorting through the boxes of reports by hand, some still not entered into the database. The job took weeks. Finally, on the 13th of April, Gordon found the note regarding Paul Onion's call to the hotline five months earlier. He read the report describing the events of January 1990, and as he read, he realized that if this man was a credible witness, his testimony could give them the link that they were looking for. Onion's statement described the vehicle, the area where the attack was committed, and the driver. Gordon took his newfound evidence directly to Superintendent Small. Small was furious. How had such an important piece of evidence been overlooked? He immediately called for the original report from Boral Police, but it was missing from their files. Fortunately, Constable Nicholson had taken a full report in her notebook, which provided more details than the original statement. Knowing that Richard and Ivan Milat were similar in appearance, police checked the two men's work records and confirmed with their employers that Richard had been working on the day of the attack, but Ivan had not. In addition, while checking Ivan's work records, they found that he'd been working in the Galston Gorge area at the time when James Gibson's pack had been found. Several of Ivan's workmates were interviewed and told of his interest in guns. One friend of Ivan's, Tony Sarah told police that Milat had owned a motorcycle and a four-wheel drive Nissan. He told them the story of the time he and Ivan were on the way to a job and drove past the Belangelo forest. You wouldn't believe what's in there, Ivan had said. But when Sarah pressed him for details, Ivan just smiled and said nothing more. At the end of April, Paul Onions received an important telephone call from Australia. Detective Stuart Wilkins told him that he was an important witness in the backpacker case and could he fly to Sydney as soon as possible? He was totally confused. From the beginning, he'd felt that the Australian police had no real interest in him or his story. Now, all of a sudden, he was their star witness? What had taken them so long? 
A week later, he was being driven out of Sydney towards Liverpool by police who wanted him to get his bearings before they interviewed him further. As they drove through Liverpool, he pointed out the small shop where he had met Bill. The shop, a news agency, was called Lombardo's. After they had driven further south along the expressway, Onions told them, This is wrong. We went through a town. You must be mistaken, they answered. There's no towns on this road. Police later discovered that at the time of the attack on Onions, January 1990, the expressway had not been completed and the Hume Highway had originally gone through the center of Mittagong. As they approached the attack site, Onions began to feel uneasy. He detailed the conversation, his voice trembling as he spoke about the tapes, the gun, and the rope. He pointed out approximately where he'd escaped. It was less than a mile from the entrance to the forest. The next day, he was shown a video lineup of a group of suspects. For purposes of identification, each image was individually numbered 1 to 13. Onions was left alone to view the images as many times as he liked. He was told to take his time. He felt strange. Four years had passed since the attack, and here he was, looking for the man who did it. He looked through the tape again and again. Two images seemed to stand out, number four and seven. He kept looking. A short time later, he called the detectives and pointed to the single image on his screen. That's him, number four. Are you sure? He was spooked by their question. I better take another look. He ran through the tape several times more and finally declared, Yes, I'm sure. The man who attacked me is number four. Paul Onions had positively identified Ivan Milat. Small was immediately informed and, after consultation with Lynch, he made his decision. They now had sufficient evidence to arrest Ivan Milat for the assault on Paul Onions. As well as the arrest warrant, they applied for search warrants of Ivan Milat's home in Eaglevale, a suburb just off the Hume Highway and a few short miles from Liverpool. On the premise that Ivan hadn't acted alone, police also applied for search warrants to search the houses of Ivan's mother and his brothers, Richard, Walter, and Bill. The property near the forest was also to be searched, as was the home of Alex Milat, who had moved to a town called Wombai, which was located several hours' drive north, near Brisbane, Queensland. All warrants were granted. The logistics of organizing multiple raids across two states were daunting. Over 300 police would be involved. To maintain secrecy, most of them would not be informed of the location and timing of the raids until just before the event. The raid on Ivan's house was codenamed Air One. As Ivan Malat's hours of work were erratic, it was decided to raid his house at 6.30 a.m. on the 22nd of May, 1994, a Sunday. Fifty police, including members of the heavily armed State Protection Group, general duty officers and police negotiators, were assembled at 2 a.m. at Campbelltown Police Station. Campbelltown was halfway between Liverpool and Ivan's house. Present at the early morning briefing, besides Small and Lynch, was Dr. Rod Milton. He briefed the chief negotiator, Wayne Gordon, on how best to approach Ivan, who was to be contacted by telephone after the premises had been surrounded. Milton suggested that Gordon use a firm and authoritative tone, as he believed that Milat would try to take control of the situation. Surveillance police had reported that Ivan's girlfriend, Chalinda Hughes, was also in the house. The plan was to calmly ask them to come out of the house, affect the arrest, and search the premises. At precisely 6.36 a.m., the team was in place. Detective Gordon dialed Ivan's number. A male voice answered. When asked if he was Ivan Milat, he answered, no. Gordon confirmed the address. It was correct. Gordon then introduced himself and advised Ivan the police were stationed around the property, were in possession of a search warrant, intended to gain entry and search the premises in relation to an armed assault. He advised Milat to come out with his girlfriend and surrender to police. Ivan mumbled something and hung up. After several minutes, nothing had happened. Mindful of the guns that Milat was known to possess, police were reluctant to storm the house. The presence of his girlfriend was also a prohibitive factor. Gordon again dialed the house and spoke to Milat a second time. When Gordon asked him why he hadn't come out as requested, Ivan replied that he thought it was a joke. Gordon convinced him that it was no joke. 
Several minutes later, the front door of number 22 Cinnabar Street, Eagles Vale, opened, and Ivan Milat and Shalinder Hughes stepped onto the front lawn and were taken into custody by two members of the State Protection Group. Several more of the group entered the house and swept the house for other occupants. After the premises were secured, the search began. Ivan was handcuffed and advised of his rights. He was also advised that he was to be questioned in relation to seven bodies that had been recovered from the Belangalo State Forest. In reply, Milat said, I don't know what you're talking about. The specialist search team was comprised of Gerald Dutton, the ballistics expert, Andy Gross, the senior crime scene investigator, and two other detectives. They began a methodical search of the four-bedroom house. At the other premises, the additional raids had gone smoothly. Police were beginning to search each of the homes at virtually the same time. The first item found in Ivan's house was a postcard. He was asked who it was from. He replied that it was from a friend in New Zealand. It began with the words, Hi, Bill. Ivan was asked if he was also known as Bill. He replied, No, it must have been a mistake. When a bullet was found in one of the bedrooms, police asked Ivan if he owned any firearms. He said that he didn't. When asked about the bullet, he said it was left from when he went shooting with his brother. The rooms were searched one at a time. In the second bedroom, two sleeping bags were found in a wardrobe. They were later identified as belonging to Simone Schmidl and Deborah Everest. In one of the other bedrooms, a bag was found containing several personal items that indicated that it was Ivan's work bag. He confirmed that fact to police. Also in the bag was a Bowie-style knife, 12 inches long. In the same bedroom was a technical manual for the road-making machine that Ivan operated at work. Inside it was a small book that sparked Dutton's interest. It was an owner's instruction manual for a Ruger 22 caliber rifle. Ivan refused to comment on the find. A photo album contained a photograph of a Harley-Davidson motorcycle and a holster. In the holster was what looked to Dutton like a Colt 45 handgun. It was the type that Onions had described. A box of 45 ammunition was later found in Ivan's bedroom. One other framed photograph showed Chalinder Hughes wearing a striped Benetton top. It was identical to a top that Carolyn Clark owned. The garage, which was attached to the house, was next. On a rack of portable shelving against a wall, a nylon sleeping bag cover was found. It contained a rolled tent. Wrapped around the tent was a purple headband identical to the one found around Simone Schmidl's skull. Also in the bag was a homemade silencer. When Milat was taken into the garage and asked about the bag, he stated that he had never seen it before. The ceiling of the garage had a manhole which opened into the roof cavity. One team member climbed a ladder to search it. Nothing was found until the insulation material was removed. Tucked inside one of the wall cavities was a plastic bag. It contained what looked like gun parts. Dutton was summoned and identified the parts as being a complete breech block assembly, a trigger, and a magazine. All were from a Ruger 22 rifle. Another object was below it in the cavity, but was beyond reach. Finally, after unsuccessfully trying to retrieve it, police resorted to cutting a hole in the adjoining wall and found that it was the rotary magazine from the same weapon. Milat was taken from the house and conveyed to Campbellton Police Station, where he was questioned. The entire interview was recorded on both video and audio tape. During the interview, Milat was evasive and uncooperative. The interview finished an hour later, and Ivan was then charged with the robbery and attempted murder of Paul Onions. Back at his house, police had found electrical tape, cable ties, and a bag of yellow and blue ropes similar to those found at the crime scenes. After searching more thoroughly inside a bedroom wardrobe, another part of the Ruger rifle was found hidden inside a leather work boot. More camping and cooking equipment was found in the kitchen pantry that belonged to Simone Schmidl. The police had hoped that they would find some evidence linking Milat to the murders, but were completely unprepared for the amount of property that was found. As the search progressed, more items came to light. A camera, which proved to be Carolyn Clark's, and a water canteen which had a scratched area on it as though a mark had been erased. Later, subjected to light analysis, the name Simi could be clearly seen. A fully loaded Browning automatic pistol was found wedged under the washing machine. 
At the other locations, more evidence was found. Rifles, shotguns, knives, crossbows, and an incredible amount of ammunition. Nearly all the camping gear belonging to the victims was found in the raids. The most disturbing find of all was unearthed in a locked cupboard in the house of Margaret Millet, Ivan's mother, a long, curved cavalry sword. Gerald Dutton, the ballistics expert, had been working on the case since the first fired cases and bullets had been recovered from the forest. He worked long hours examining all the ballistic evidence and was eventually rewarded for his diligence. The fired cases and several of the bullets matched the Ruger 22 rifle that was found in Ivan Milat's home. Ivan Robert Marco Milat was charged with the murders of the seven backpackers and was committed to stand trial. At a bail hearing, several weeks after the arrest, Ivan dismissed his lawyer after being advised by his counsel to plead guilty. Ironically, it was the same lawyer that had won him an acquittal during the 1971 alleged rape trial. The trial was set down for June 1995. But Ivan Milat did not stand trial in June. In fact, it was almost a year before the case came to court. It was delayed while Milat's lawyers argued with the state's legal aid office over their rate of pay. Eventually, they accepted the original offer and were ready to go to trial. Ivan Milat sat passively in the courtroom as the jury filed in for the first day of the biggest murder trial in Australia's criminal history. The presiding judge, Justice David Hunt, asked the Crown Prosecutor to begin. Mark Tedeschi, QC, Queen's Counsel, made a brief opening statement during which he told the jury that Ivan Milat would be proven guilty of seven cruel murders, whether he had accomplices or not. He wasted no time in calling his first witness, Paul Onions. Milat stared at him as he took the witness stand, the hint of a faint smile on his lips. Onions positively identified Milat as the person who attacked him. Tedeschi led him through his evidence, and Onions waited for Milat's defense counsel, Terry Martin, to attack his testimony during cross-examination. The attack did not come. A few points of identification were challenged, but not the scrutiny that he was expecting. After Onions stepped down, the parents of each of the victims were called to the stand one at a time. The courtroom was hushed as they spoke about the last time they'd seen their children alive. Some suppressed sobs, and others struggled to control the seething anger that they felt when they looked into the eyes of the monster that stood accused of murdering their children. The list continued as the evidence was presented. 356 exhibits and hundreds of photographs all had to be explained in detail. The days crawled by in the hot and stuffy courtroom as each witness was called. The public galleries were full every day. Members of the media from all over the world jostled for position in the crowded press gallery, knowing that the case was big news. When the t-shirt that Joanne Walters last wore was displayed, bearing numerous cuts, front and back, the courtroom fell silent. So too when Dr. Bradhurst took the stand to describe the injuries inflicted on each of the victims. The most dramatic moment was when he was shown the sword found at Ivan's house. He suggested that it was very likely the type of weapon used to decapitate Anya Habshid. The enormous weight of evidence and the long list of witnesses took weeks to present. Gradually, during cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses, the defense tactics unfolded. They were determined to convince the jury that Ivan was not responsible for the murders, but instead implied that his brothers, Richard and Walter committed the crimes and implicated him by planting the evidence at his house. Twelve weeks and 145 witnesses later, the prosecution completed its presentation of a strong case. The first witness called by the defense was Ivan Milat. Martin led him through the accusations that had been made. His defense was simple. He denied everything. During cross-examination, Tedeschi proved merciless. He pursued Milat on every point. When asked how come he came to be in possession of the property belonging to the victims, he answered, Someone's trying to make me look bad. He faltered after Tedeschi reminded him that the gun parts that they said were put in his home by someone else were painted in camouflage colors in the same fashion as his other hunting equipment. Tedeschi pointed out that it was an amazing coincidence, considering that Milat had already admitted that the paints used were in fact his. In the trial's 15th week, 
After all the evidence had been presented and argued against, the final summations began. Tedeschi told the jury of Ivan Milat's arrogance in believing that he would get away with the attack on onions and the abduction and murder of seven young people, an arrogance that prevented him from disposing of the property belonging to his victims. His address ran for three days as he spelled out the many pertinent facts that indicated that Ivan Milat was the killer, none of which had been suitably explained by his defense. Martin began his summing up by telling the jury that obviously someone in the Malat family was responsible for the murders, but not his client. He tried to explain away the damning evidence as a conspiracy against Ivan by his own brothers. He began to narrow down his attack, suggesting that Richard made the comments about the murders to his friends at work and may have been in a position to commit all eight crimes, even though he was at work at the times of the offenses. He ended his comments in the same vein. His client, Ivan Milat, had been set up. Justice Hunt took two days to summarize the evidence for the jury. At 2.42 p.m. on the 24th of July, he sent the jury out to consider their verdict. Three days passed, still no verdict. Meanwhile, the Milat family, confident of an acquittal, made plans for a celebratory dinner. A strange ritual, considering Ivan's defense was based on the implication of members of his own family. On Saturday, the 27th of July, 1995, the remaining jurors filed into the courtroom to deliver their verdict. Justice Hunt asked Ivan to stand as the jury foreman read the verdicts. As each of the eight charges were read, the verdict was the same. Guilty. Ivan Milat was asked if he had anything to say. He replied, I'm not guilty of it. That's all I have to say. The sentences were then handed down. For the attack on Paul Onions, six years imprisonment. For the remaining seven counts of willful murder, a life sentence for each. Ivan Milat was sentenced to prison for the term of his natural life. On the Sunday following his conviction, Ivan was transported to a maximum security prison in Maitland, southwest of Sydney. After the normal prison induction of showers and the issue of bedding, Milat was welcomed to the jail in a manner that he could not have expected. While waiting in line to be assigned to a cell, he was approached by a tall, well-built inmate and punched to the ground. Despite his bad start, Ivan settled into prison life in a cell in A-Wing. Several months later, on the 17th of July, he was involved in a foiled escape attempt that was masterminded by George Savas a former city councilman who was serving time for drug trafficking. Ironically, Ivan was immediately transferred to the high-security wing of Goulburn Jail, only a few short miles from Belangelo Forest. The next day, Savas was found hanged in his cell. To this date, Ivan Milat has not been charged for his part in the escape attempt. As a follow-up to the Milat story, several reporters approached members of Ivan's family for interviews. Some of them refused, Others demanded money. Richard Millat, when asked by the press if he feared he would be arrested in relation to the murders, replied, Not really. If they wanted me, they'd have me by now. Margaret, Ivan's mother, was shocked by the sentence handed down on her son, but told reporters, If he did these crimes, then he deserves to be punished. Other reporters tracked Ivan's brother Boris down to a secret location, where he was supposedly hiding from his family. When asked if he thought that Ivan was innocent, he answered, All my brothers are capable of extreme violence, given the right time and place, individually. He continued, The things I can tell you are much worse than what Ivan's meant to have done. Everywhere he's worked, people have disappeared. I know where he's been. He then asked the reporters if they thought Ivan was guilty. They replied that they did. If Ivan's done these murders, he told them, I reckon he's done a hell of a lot more. How many, they asked. His reply was disturbing. About 28. Ivan Malat to this day continues to profess his innocence. He's formed a support group that lobbies the government for his release. Ivan Malat was moved to solitary confinement after prison officers found a hacksaw blade hidden in his cell. The searchers, using a metal detector, found the blade inside a packet of biscuits. At the time of the routine search, Milat was already segregated from other prisoners in the maximum security wing of Goldburn Jail. He's indicated that he'll attempt escape at every opportunity. While in prison, 
Ivan Milat turned to self-mutilation in an attempt to jumpstart his appeal to the High Court in Sydney. He hoped that by swallowing razor blades, staples, and a spring from a toilet mechanism, and periodically starving himself, he would get the judge's attention and maybe get the process moving a little faster. However, Ivan's desperate ploy failed to work. In July 2001, Judge William Gamow refused Milat's appeal, stating that there's no reason to doubt the correctness of the decision of the New South Wales Criminal Court of Appeal, the AP Worldstream reported. Many, especially the victims' families, were relieved by the court's decision because it would ensure that Ivan would spend the rest of his natural life behind bars. There was little doubt that if he were ever released early, he would likely kill again and again. Of course, Ivan denies that he's capable of ever doing such a thing and continues to profess his innocence in the seven murders for which he was earlier convicted. Despite Ivan's declarations, investigators have tried to link him to a further six disappearances of young women between 1978 and 1980. All of the women are thought to be dead, even though none of their bodies have ever been found. At the time of the girls' disappearances, Ivan allegedly worked or lived in close proximity to where they were last seen. Ivan's murderous record has led to his being suspected in their probable murders, although there's no evidence directly linking him to any of the cases. Ivan was ordered to give evidence at an inquest in the summer of 2001 into three of the girls' disappearances. During the inquiry, he was questioned about Leanne Goodall, 20, Robin Hickey, 17, and Amanda Robinson, 14, all of whom went missing from New South Wales and Newcastle in 1978 and 1979. According to an article by Tony Larner in the Sunday Mercury, detectives reopened the files on the three missing women after the discovery of a female jawbone on a Newcastle beach in March 1998, which was, incidentally, not linked to either woman. Nonetheless, Ivan worked with a road crew just minutes from where two of the women were last seen. During the line of questioning, Ivan looked directly at the families of the girls and firmly stated that he had nothing to do with their disappearance, Denise McNamara said in an AAP General News article. Based on a lack of evidence, he has not been formally charged. During another inquiry in 2003, Ivan was questioned into the disappearances of two 20-year-old nurses, Jillian Jameson and Deborah Balkan, who were last seen leaving a hotel with a man in dirty work clothes the AAP General News reported in December 2003. The article stated that at the time, Ivan was working at the Department of Main Roads, now the RTA, less than two kilometers from the hotel. Ivan flatly denied having anything to do with the women and the investigation against him was stalled due to a lack of evidence. In 2005, he was questioned about another girl who went missing while hitchhiking home in January 1980 named Annette Briffa, 18. She never made it home and was thought murdered. It's uncertain if Ivan was in the area at the time she went missing, but because her case matched those he was previously convicted of, he could never be totally eliminated as a suspect. Deputy State Coroner Karl Milovanovich was quoted saying in a January 2005 AAP article, The reality is, there is a chance that Ivan could have murdered more women than those for which he was convicted. However, unless he confesses, no one will ever know the true number of victims attributed to him. Thus, investigators are simply left to guess, hoping to one day strike it lucky and close one of the many unsolved cases that haunt the region. On the 26th of January, 2009, Milat cut off his little finger with a plastic knife with the intention of mailing it to the High Court of Australia to force an appeal. He was taken to Goldbourne Base Hospital under high security. However, on the 27th of January, 2009, Milat was returned to prison after doctors decided surgery was not possible. Milat had previously harmed himself in 2001 when he swallowed razor blades, staples, and other metal objects. In May 2011, Milat went on a nine-day hunger strike, losing 15 kilograms in an unsuccessful attempt to be given a PlayStation. In May 2019, Milat was transferred to the Prince of Wales Hotel, Randwick, and was subsequently diagnosed with terminal esophageal cancer. Following his treatment, he was transferred to the Long Bay Correctional Center to continue his custodial sentences. On the 9th of August, 2019, 
a terminally ill Milat was moved to a secure treatment unit located at the Prince of Wales Hospital following the loss of 20 kilograms in previous weeks. Milat was also exhibiting a high temperature. His status, however, was reported as not life-threatening. On the 27th of October, 2019, Milat died from esophagus and stomach cancer at 4.07 a.m. in the hospital wing at Long Bay Correctional Center. He was 74 years old. Thank you.